And yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I know that I'm up against a lot of very famous speakers in the other rooms. But uh, even though I don't have as many Twitter followers, I think I'm going to give you a good session. I've got some special stuff and some never before seen demos, except for myself, that I'm going to show you if you want. Um, just before we start, who has heard of config management before? Who has not? Raise your hand. Who's really shy and hates raising their hand in public? All right, excellent. So I'm going to, is it okay if I do this at a fairly hard or difficulty level? Uh, so far, I've, everyone that I've talked to has been very smart, and the conference organizers have said, don't be shy to give a good session. So I'm going to do that. Um, I guess I'm going to get going. Does that work? Good for you? Cool. Hey, everyone. So um, I'm going to just, I showed you this video. Uh, I'm going to go pretty quickly. If you have questions, try and save them till the end. But if you're really, really stuck, um, just let me know, and I'll see what I can do. Uh, I'm a hacker. I work on config management things. I work at Red Hat. I write a technical blog called The Technical Blog of James. Um, who's seen my blog? Just raise your hand. Um, if you haven't seen my blog, just raise your hand anyway, so I seem really popular. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'm a work, work as a, I used to be a physiologist, or I studied as a physiologist, but I don't really work in that anymore. And I'm really into DevOps and so on. So just some background. Uh, you can't hear the sound, but it's basically beaker screaming because everything is on fire. I did a lot of puppet stuff, and um, I learned a lot of things there. But there were a lot of things uh, that I wanted to have different in Puppet that uh, weren't really possible. I made some really outrageous hacks to try and get there. But um, I didn't want to have to build a new, new tool. And people were like, don't reinvent the wheel. But I really wanted a newer, shinier, nicer wheel. And so I've done it. I'm sorry. Um, I wanted just before I did that to ask, um, was there really um, the need for a new tool, or was the existing stuff good enough already? And what do you think? Was the existing stuff good enough? No. Come on, don't be shy. So this is my, my guy that answers the question. I've used him in some slides before, so no surprise. He just nopes everything. So long story short, I sat down, and after a bit of time working, I have basically a near feature complete for the mi minimally viable set uh, tool called MGMT. We have a nice logo. The tool has two parts, an engine and the language. And I'm going to show you a bit of both uh, working together. Um, just some quick design points about the tool. So there's three main uh, parts of the engine that you should know about. So if you have a graph of resources like you would in Puppet, um, they run basically one thing at a time. We actually can run in parallel. We're event-driven in a lot of different ways, which I'll show you. And we actually work as a distributed system, which I'll also get to. These three are the main points. Here's a graph of resources. You can imagine these blue boxes being the individual resources of work. So install a package or uh, set up a file or something like that. And the uh, black arrows are just the dependencies. But what actually happens in most tools is they do something called a topological sort. I and mean, that's just this, this light red arrow. Can you see the, right, the red arrow OK? That just sort of picks an order that's safe through the graph to make sure it all uh, works correctly. But actually, in MGMT, because we can run in parallel, we can run everything on the left at the same time as everything on the right. And also, in addition to that, once 1A is finished running, 2A and 2B can both run in parallel. And then 3A will actually run after that's happened. Make sense? Do you want to see a quick demo of this for fun? All right. I'll just show you. I'm actually going to, I'm going to actually just run. Uh, Open up. Is that big enough for you to see? Yep. MGMT. I actually have a, a little example. It looks actually about like this. And I have it in Puppet. Um, and I have the Puppet version right, where is it? Right here. So I'm actually going to time this Puppet version. And I also have the same version in MGMT on the left. So I'm going to actually start the Puppet run. Puppet's running. And then I can actually take some time and then eventually start the MGMT version. They're both running at the same time. And what I've act asked it to do is to run and then shut down. So normally, MGMT can run continuously, so it tracks the state over time. But in this case, I've asked it, when you're done working, shut down. And you can see Puppet is already you know, doing its normal thing, running its facts. Uh, MGMT is already halfway through this graph. And finally, the first Puppet thing sort of starts running, again, doing that topological sort. Um, and here we are already at uh, exec4. You can see in this graph, it looks like this. Doing another command, and now it's actually shutting down MGMT uh, because it's basically done. Now, normally we'll run continuously, but just to give you an idea, of all your existing workloads can just be run much, much faster 
The software itself is much faster, but algorithmically, because we run continuously and because we run in parallel, it'll just save tons of time. Uh, we could wait for Puppet to finish running, but I'd rather go on. Shall we go on? Um, it's not to diss Puppet. So I've learned quite a lot about Puppet. It's just that there are a lot of things that I think just needed to be done differently. So um, let's show you some events. Puppet finally finished. Oops. Let's not type x random commands by accident. So um, I have a little hello option. Oops. So I'm going to run this uh, example that just describes one single file. And you'll see that actually it creates this file right here. I've asked it to say, hello, Australia. Um, and the cool thing is, as I said, it runs continuously. So if I actually remove this file, you can see the engine actually woke up and fixed the state and put the file right back. Right? So you can remove the file, it comes right back. And it works so quickly, you can remove the file and then cat the contents of the file. As fast as you run this, it will actually have a chance to then uh, fix the state before Bash finishes its job. Okay, so a very, very efficient tool. And if you really want to take this to the extreme, you can even use the watch command like this. Um, and it basically will just run something over and over very quickly. And you can see that um, it's actually spinning very, very quickly to actually fix the state in real time. Okay, everyone cool with that? Anyone lost or confused? Shy? I'm here for you. So if you are really confused about this, let me know. If not, I have more demos to show you. Yes? All right. You're a very polite audience. You're also very shy, I've noticed. So we can do this for every kind of resource that's built into MGMT. We have, I think, about 20 different resources now. File, packages, services, uh, virtual machines. Uh, EC2 instance is a, a resource as well, so you can declare the state of your cloud computing if you're into that sort of thing, uh, packages, and so on. Um, I think that this is what config management should have been. Okay, this is what I would have defined config management to be. But some people actually see this technology as something else as well in parallel. Anyone guess what it might be? Scream it out if you, if you have thought. Don't be shy. Full um, Actually, no. I don't think it's orchestration. But it's a, we'll talk about that later. Um, anyone else? I, I think this particular thing is actually kind of like monitoring. So if you think about how you set up a cluster, you do all this work to set up all the automation for the cluster, but then you can't put it in production because you don't have monitoring set up, right? You're all good sysadmins who don't put things in production without monitoring, right? <laughs> yes, I see lots of smiling faces, but that's okay. Yeah, but that's okay because if we can build in some sort of like detection of state and monitoring in a, in a way into the resource level, once you've done the config management, a good chunk of your work is already done. So hopefully this just makes your life easier. Make sense? I want to make you have more free time. So let's just talk about topologies a little bit. And your orchestration is going to come up. So this is a very simple topology where you have a bunch of clients that go off and initiate a connection to some server. What topology is this called? Call it out. Client server. Don't be shy. Um, what are some problems with this topology? One server. Uh, one server, which is a single point of failure. What's another problem with this? It might not contact the server, but in particular, the, the, the performance. So if you had many, many, many clients, this could be eventually a performance limitation. There's other things, but pardon me? It doesn't scale. That's right, the scale. Um, so uh, this is a good topology because it's very well understood. Um, here's a different topology. This is a central orchestrator, otherwise known as an orchestrator. This is when you have one single thing that goes out and initiates connections to a whole bunch of machines. Um, what are the problems with this topology? Single point of failure, exactly. Same as before. Anything else? Scale, Scale exactly. Same thing again. So um, this is also not what we're doing. Um, this is actually just a fully meshed uh, network where everyone talks to everyone else. Uh, this is a problem because if you have a very large number of hosts, you just have too many connections, so it doesn't work. So what we actually do in MGMT is the core uh, software itself actually will cluster itself together using the RAF protocol and will pick some small number of central hosts, that M1234, or whatever number it might be, to all interconnect. And that'll be a relatively small number relative to the size of the cluster. And then everyone else will just be a peer that connects to any one of those. And that's OK, because if this one dies, this guy can take over as a new leader, and someone else can reconnect. One of those clients can reconnect. And the cool thing about this is once we have a cluster that's built this way, we can actually exchange some data uh, with the RAF protocol and do some fun things. So if you'd like, I have some demos I can show you. Want to see a demo? All right, we're getting, we're waking up, cool. So what we're going to do, just kind of like a distributed um, sort of demo to see what's happening. So I have actually, let me just see, exchange zero. So I'm just going to start up one host one at a time, just so you can see what's happening. 
So I'm going to start up the host here. Um, and it's actually just going to I'm going to remove this hello file. And I'm just going to, um, oops, exchange dash h. There we go. So what it's actually going to show is on my right, I've just actually put um, a little display that shows you what each file is going to contain. And I'm just going to simulate a bunch of different servers who are actually going to create a file just with their state, just so you can actually see what's happening. But think about this as, as something else. So every server is going to start up. It's going to automatically cluster itself together. And it's going to actually generate uh, some random string. And it's going to put that string into the center um, with everyone else. And when everyone else joins, they're going to put their random string in and read all the other ones that are in the table. Kind of like a conference room. You go into a conference room, hi Dave, hi Steve, hi Julie, whatever, and you find out what all their names are too. So it's kind of a bit like service discovery. So let's see if this works. If we run the second one, watch how fast when it starts up, it should update both of them. I hope. So boom, in real time, under a millisecond or so, or under a second or so. I uh, start up a third one. You want to see a third one? Yes? So you can see they can actually, each entry there is a different server, and there's only two alive at the moment. So start up the third one, boom, and under a second you have the third one that actually can see H1 and H2, as well as itself, of course, and the others also notice in real time that there's a new host in the cluster. Um, another pattern this can be used for is suppose you have a load balancer and a bunch of web servers. As the web servers come online, they'll say, hey, I'm a web server, uh, this is my IP address instead of a random string, and that load balancer can actually then say, okay, I'm going to react in a second and open up a route to you. Does that make sense? Um, and this is all within one tool, and it's very simple to model. We can do more, but I'd rather show you more demos if you'd like. Yeah? You want to see more, or are you fed up of demos? More demos. More demos. Okay, good. I'm just going to actually violently kill these processes to save time, but they can shut down cleanly if you want. So um, back to here, showing you this stuff. Um, all of this stuff that does work, creating files, virtual machines, and so on, that's in the engine. But to actually model the graph of resources, like that same graph picture we saw at the beginning, to actually model that, we actually need some way to specify this. I am not a fan of just blasting everything to a giant YAML file and saying, OK. And the reason is because I want to actually model things. I want to make intelligent decisions, because fundamentally, the assumption that Puppet and a lot of other tools made that your infrastructure is static is just not true. The load changes over time. A lot of things change over time. Um, error scenarios change. So there might be failures in disks that weren't there an hour ago. And you might want to reactively do things instead of saying, just page the system in and come fix the problem. Let's start programming those scenarios. And if we're going to program those scenarios, let's do it in a safe way. Here's a nice little quote you can think about. So language has some properties. Um, I've had to build this language, but it's a very small, safe language. Um, I want it to be safe. I want it to be powerful. And I want it to be easy to reason about, so you can understand what's happening. And um, I'm going to show you this demo first of all. So uh, I've just sort of made up the syntax highlighting, because I don't have a syntax highlighter yet, which is one of the shitty things about writing a language. Um, you'll see the code is actually out of order, which is kind of strange. And we'll get to that in a moment. That's just for example purposes. But the main things that are happening is I have some date time function. Um, I have some math over here. So I'm adding the number of seconds in a year to the current date. And I have this load. And I'm putting all those values into a struct. And then down at the bottom, I'm just printing that out into the file. So that's a resource declaration. And I want to show you what that actually looks like when you, oops, when you run it. Um, so I'm going to run this on the left. And oh, I'm just going to. Run a little watch on the, on the right. So what I've done is all that data that I just printed out to a file, again, you don't normally want to print it out to a file. You probably want to do something useful. But just for illustrative purposes, you can see actually that it's changing in real time. And that's because all of the functions and built-in things in the language are reactive. So the date time is not a static thing at the second when the code goes by. It's actually a moving, living thing that has a time component. And every second, the number of seconds since 1970, which is basically the date, in time changes. So every second, the code reevaluates the parts that are out of date and pushes new data to the resources. So you can see it's doing some math. Um, there's a, a function that we have the load. So the system load um, in the last minute is 0 0.2. And because that, every second, every five seconds, the kernel 
recalculates that math and spits out a new value, which we watch for, and then we can just use that value to do something interesting. And just for fun, I made a little VU meter that actually is measuring the volume in my laptop microphone and showing that in real time right here. So if I'm really quiet for a second, you see it goes down to very, very quiet. Um, and you could use this for fun, for example. Like if you had a microphone in your sysadmin or ops room, if the volume was really, really loud for a certain amount of time, you might want to automatically set all your file systems to read only so that you don't like in anger make a change or something. So um, just a silly example, but um, the idea is that I'm just making up an engine and a language that you can then be creative about how you build your infrastructure. Um, if you want to believe me that this actually works, we're going to be quiet. And then if you want to applause when I point at you, we'll see if it actually goes up and it can hear you. Are you ready? Okay, so it's real. And all this code is online. So you can test it at home and build, you know, some thing that when you hear the door slam that the computer prints out, stop, stop slamming the door or whatever. I mean, be creative. So that's just a silly example, but I hopefully it will inspire you about what's really possible. Fair enough? I see a few smiles, so I guess I'm on the right track. So let's get a little bit more complicated. Everyone okay with that? Yes? All right. So here's a cool example. You can see here, initially, I'm storing the date time in this DT variable. And then over here, every time this variable appears, I'm using this curly bracket syntax to say 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 into separate variables. And then I'm actually, I didn't paste it here because it's a big, long line, but I have a big printf that pastes all those variables into a file. And I want to show you what that does. Oops. So I'm going to run that example. Um, I think it's named history. And you'll see, actually, this is that example. It's showing um, the current date of time at the very top. That's this 0 entry right here. And if you look at the 1, 2, 3, these are actually the previous value, the previous value before that, and the value before that. Because if we have a reactive language, we can actually access previous uh, values of that variable. And if we have that information, we can do a lot of interesting things. We can actually tell um, what's happening, uh, what happened in the past, and make some decisions for the future. So that's just a sort of illustrative example. Let's build something real with that. Everyone understood what this does? Good? Just one value. This could be load. This could be anything you want. I'm going to kill that. I'm just going to start up another example. So what is this, dear folks? This is a thermostat. This is uh, in my parents' house. You can see that it's in Celsius, the correct units for temper measurement. Kelvin is also acceptable. Um, and it has an interesting property. Uh, what is that property? Call it out if you know. If you don't, it's OK. It's kind of a, pardon me? It does have a feedback loop. Um, in addition to that feedback loop, there's another property. Pardon me? Analog. It is analog, but it doesn't have to be. Um, the, the, the property is, this is actually just a clearer photo. Um, the property is called hysteresis. And what hysteresis does is suppose you have uh, a room like this one, which is very warm. And it's very, very cold outside. Um, the heaters are turning on. They're bringing you up to a certain set point, And then it'll click off when it gets that temperature. And the temperature will fall because it's cold outside until it goes back on. And if the outside was really, really efficient at cooling, and inside was really, really efficient, it would click on and off and on and off and sort of do that infinitely, which would kind of be annoying because you'd hear this clicking or so on. So we want to actually slow those things down and actually put thresholds in there. And that's really what hysteresis is. So it can detect, knowing the previous state, um, where you actually should be doing. Should you be turning on, or are you waiting to drop below some threshold before you turn back on again? Um, I think it shows a little bit better with an example. You want to see an example? All right. So um, I have a hysteresis example here. So I'm just going to run this on the left. Um, and I'll actually, I just can actually just show you the code. I don't usually show it, but um, you're a smart group, so you can see this. So here is just, um, I'm going to show you just to get some feedback what's happening. I'm going to print out some of these values, the threshold and the load average in a text file. This gets just put into a big struct. 
And here's a very simple hysteresis calculation. Um, you don't have to worry about this. This is what actually is the math to do a, a 10 second hysteresis calculation. And, and that basically uh, gives you a Boolean about am I over threshold or am I under threshold for a sufficiently long time. And based on that state down here, if, we're, if the load is too high, shut off, otherwise running. And that's just the state of a virtual machine. So we have a virtual machine resource, so we actually, in real time, control the on-off switches of these things. So if I actually, that's running. Over here, I'm just gonna show you this. So this, I'm just printing out every, five, every half a second that there's how many VMs are running, in this case, two. You can see the, the load and the threshold. And if we actually now falsely uh, increase the load, okay, we're just going to do some things to trick our computer into thinking that there's a lot of load. Um, the idea is when it hits 1.5, it's going to shut down one of those VMs. All right? And boom, it shut down. Now watch what happens. I'm going to just bring the load down. And watch what happens when it goes below 1.5. It's not going to turn it back on yet because we don't want it to flap on and off. We're going to wait till it's below for 10 seconds. There it is. It's below 1.5. In a few more seconds, it'll have been below for long enough. And then it will hopefully turn it back on. And there it goes. Cool? So this could be sort of, for example, you're a VPS or something. You have some containers or some VMs or some you know, service that you provide. And when they're using a lot of CPU, maybe it's good to shut some of them down and reschedule them on another machine. And you can do that with MGMT as well. So that maybe your customers are, you know, maybe you want to redistribute the load so it's more balanced, so everyone gets more of the I.O. instead of having 10 machines all on the same hardware going like crazy. Do you like that? You guys are very quiet. Don't be shy. If you, if you hate this, if you have questions, don't be shy. How much time do I have left? Got a good, good roll. All right, I got lots of time, so that's good. Um, I'll just see if in case anyone really is lost. I have some more stuff to show you, but I want to just slow down in case anyone is overwhelmed and wants to ask a question. Anyone? Call it out and I'll repeat it. What's the ports that The communication. So the question is about ports and communication. Um, it actually uses uh, etcd, which we actually compile into the whole binary, so you don't have to do that standalone, and it uses the standard etcp. At CD ports, so uh, 2379 and 2380, or you can configure those as well. So those sort of standard rules apply. The does follow-up question is, does it clash with etcd? Uh, the question is, does it clash with etcd? Uh, only if you also have etcd running. Uh, in that case, you can either pick different ports for either etcd or this, or you can actually even, uh, instead of running another etcd, just use this one for that as well. Um, anyways. so. Um, I'll show you a few more things, if you like. Um, I have like a bonus demo and a few other things in case, uh, in case we have some more time. So, uh, I'm just gonna destroy these VMs, which I no longer need. So um, this actually has some interesting properties, which I'd like to talk about. Um, are you all Haskell programmers, anyone? No? Um, are you all JavaScript programmers? Um, I don't know. So the, we don't want our code to like crash and destroy things and break our infrastructure. Um, and so the really cool thing about the language is we're, it's actually kind of like a functional reactive programming language. If anyone's familiar with FRP, that's basically the, the design, but it's a DSL, so it's much more limited and has a few different properties. But that was sort of the inspiration. And the, the lovely thing about, in addition to that, even though we'd like to uh, remove the ability for the language to actually crash once it's compiled, and I think we're fairly close if it's not there already. Um, if you did actually have an error when the language was running, that's okay because what actually happens is the language runs continuously and pushes a stream of graphs to the engine, which then once one another, one after another, runs them. That's why you saw the time changing, okay? Because it's updating that graph uh, every second and it's then causing the engine to make that graph real on your systems every second. So if for some reason that stream of graph would stop, you just would not get any new configuration applied on your machine, but you probably wouldn't take out a whole data center doing that. So it's kind of a cool property. Um, remember before I had that example that was kind of out of order? Um, the reason was because you actually can do this. The code itself, all of the expressions and statements, actually form a graph. 
Um, and you should probably write code in the logical order of execution. Um, and we might even add a compile flag to ensure that that's the case. But it's technically not actually required. It just turns out that because we have this graph structure that's modeling the flow of data. So from each value, it knows where it feeds to from date time function to the date time variable that gets used in the printf function, which then goes to the file resource. So that's actually a graph. So circles and arrows pointing all its way through. Make sense? Got some smiles. Um, variables are actually immutable. So this actually pr um, prevents a whole class of bugs, uh, just by not being able to do x equals 5 and then x equals 7. Uh, that is just built in. Uh, great stuff with that. Uh, limits our language a little bit more, but it turns out to not actually make it that much harder to build anything. Um, I talked about hysteresis. There's different kinds of hysteresis we can model. Uh, there's sequence-based, where we look at the previous values, and potentially you could also have time-based hysteresis, where you look at values some number of seconds ago and so on. Uh, interesting things. It's a real-life property, and hopefully you can use that as well. Um, and again, I've talked about reactive variables. Um, this is not actually implemented yet, but actually having error um, magic being done as a reactive variable. So imagine you had an error variable, which started, you know, putting out values when there were error scenarios, so you could actually build in how you handle errors in your system as well. But that's, that's not a topic for today. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do. I have actually some bonus stuff, because I wanted to know how much time it would take. So I'm going to sort of finish the main uh, presentation, and we can go back. Um, this is really about getting you all involved, so you have to help. Um, you can use this, test it, patch it. If you do not help me contribute to this project, it will die. Uh, document it, share it, tell your friends, tell your system uh, friends, blog about it if you want, tweet it if you're on Twitter, discuss, hack on it, and so on. Um, the sad thing is that I work for Red Hat, and they were actually very kind in funding a lot of this work that I did, um, but they've recently killed my funding completely. So uh, they're not paying for me to come here or any of this stuff. So if you want to help, um, Please try and help me find a home for MGMT. That would be great. Um, and even if you can't find a home, just contribute to the project because I'm trying to just run it as a, my, you know, evenings and weekends sort of project in the meantime because I think it's got a good future. So uh, that's that's the reality with software. Um, I'm going to recap a little bit later. Do you want to see a few more demos? So I have this thing when I come to cool conferences, I can't help like hacking. Uh, and so I was up last night. And I just finished a demo, a bonus demo, to show you something totally strange and weird, if you're ready for it. Yes. Now, if you don't give me some serious enthusiasm, I'm not going to show you. Do you want to see this demo? That's pretty weak sauce. Even for, all right. You want to see the demo? Oh, all right, I'll show you, just because I want to show you. So um, I'm going to show you the code first. Um, examples lang states 0. This isn't on git hub or anything yet. So what I've actually done, um, I want these things to be living, breathing things that, um, and actually, this is just early, so we'll, we might consider actually having a way to model this in the language itself. So it's a bit of a more like raw demo. But um, what we actually can do, so here this is just some variable that represents a, a string, so the namespace we're working in, just so we don't clash with other things. And there's these cool reactive functions that can put things into etcd and take them out as well. Uh, this particular one will actually look up for your particular host name um, the value that's associated with it. So in this particular namespace, call it namespace foo, what is the value that you've stored next to your host name? Kind of like that exchange example at the beginning. Um, and then here, we're just going to look that up, and based on the value, we're going to run different code. So we might run this code, or that code, or this code. And if we run, if we look up the variable and we're in state one, then we're just going to write that to a file so you can see, hey, we're in state one, whatever state one means. And then we're going to use this key value resource to set us to state two. And then we'll respond. And if we're in state two, we're going to say that we're in state two and set it to state three. And if we're in state three, we're going to say that we're in state three and then set it to state one. Does that make sense? So it's going to be a state machine that says, I have a variable, go to the next stage, go to the next stage, and then go in a circle, kind of like an oscillator. I've put a one second delay, because otherwise this shit goes really fast, <laughs> as you can imagine. Let's run it. Run it. States, oops, 
zero. So you're going to run it on the left. I think this should be right. And just go to all these files. And just so you can see, watch. Dash n 0, 0 0.1. So just so you can actually see this, the file changing over time. And I've just made the most boring demo because you have something that goes one, two, three. Um, congratulations, you're counting with James. <laughs> so uh, I know my demos are a bit abstract, and I really do apologize for that. It's just how I think about when I'm building these things. But the, the takeaway idea about this is instead, think of, um, and again, we might probably have a way to model this in the language that will make it much easier for you. But just to think about it, imagine you had states where you had state equals healthy in your cluster. And then you have state, um, a state where uh, performance degraded because there were some RAID failures. So when it detects that the performance state is degraded, you move to state degraded, and then when you're in state degraded, you now actually stop letting um, customers, uh, you might throttle down their storage, like bandwidth, so that things go a little slower until the RAID reboot, uh, rebuilds or something. Or you might send out an email that says, uh, we are an integrated state, do something different, or anything, right? These are really just abstract ideas that will let you model your infrastructure so that when things happen, and things happen, right, um, the system will autonomously react and do whatever you programmed it to do to be an autoscaler or a state machine or so on. What do you think? It's cool. It's cool? I think it's cool. So um, what I'm not going to show you today is um, there's a, some distributed patterns where in the cluster you actually share the states throughout the cluster and do some fancier things. For example, you have a dozen machines and you let them each reboot two at a time, for example, that sort of thing. But all of these things are possible. So I'm going to do a quick time check. Dear timekeeper, how much time do we have left? How much? 13 minutes. Do you want to see some more demos or are you fed up? I've got a few more demos if you want. Um, so I have, I have some older demos. I'm actually going to pull up some old slides just to show you a demo if you're interested. So I have a nice drawing which I forgot to put in my slides. Oops. There we go. Pop that up for a second. Um, Oops. Do you have any demos but building an actual server, something with configuring, say, Apache? Yeah. Uh, the gentleman asked, do I have an ex exact, um, uh, pardon me, a demo building something like Apache, for example? Um, I actually don't. Um, I'm happy to show you that. And we could do it right now if that's what you'd prefer to do. The problem is it's exceedingly boring. Um, it's really, uh, it's, it's very possible. I mean, all this stuff that, you know, package file service, templates, Apache, that all is very straightforward. And for a lot of code, you won't actually necessarily need all this reactive stuff, right? You also get all of the traditional stuff that we're used to just doing the straightforward things, but now you also get the reactivity. So if I showed you the Apache thing, it would work, but it wouldn't do anything more than you're used to. So for that reason, I actually haven't, but I would absolutely love if you send a patch for that sort of little thing, um, and we can add that to the examples, if you like seeing that kind of thing. Um, there is one limitation, which is we don't actually have a concept of modules for the source code yet. So you can actually build separate modules. Everything's just a bunch of code at the moment. So uh, this tool is still early in that respect, but hopefully that will be fixed pretty soon. Does that answer your question? Good. Um, yes, go ahead. How would you? Uh you represent you represent all the state in in code, all the state that you want to achieve. Uh, what do you mean, the state in code? Okay, uh, where I work, servers want to be. Uh, I want servers to be in a particular state. Yeah. And uh, so I, pre I keep that state in some files. Okay. So how how does M M how does this management, how does this code um, read that state? Um, so there's the state that you request, and there's the state that is actually on the systems. So the state that you request is declared with the code, and that's that MGMT language that I've been showing you. The state that's on the system um, is something that it will actually do two things. So at startup per resource, it will actually first 
um, start a watch so we can detect when that state changes. And that's how we can run continuously. And then it actually has a function that will actually check, is the state correct or not? And if so, make the changes to bring it to the correct state. The watching part of that resource knows when someone has poked at it, which means we don't have to pull continuously to check if the state has changed. After that first check is done, the watch was already running. And now if someone does something bad, watch will say, hey, please recheck. Someone might have deleted that file or edited the contents or so on. Does that sort of answer your question? If not, come ask me after. It does. Yeah, so each different resource has a way that we actually get Linux or some service on the system to watch things on our behalf in some situations. So for files, we use iNotify. For services, we use systemd events, uh, packages, and so on. And I'll show you a package example that's actually right that. Perfect. So here's, um, here's a graph. Um, just, it's a graph I drew. There's two files, some packages, and uh, some service. Is there anything wrong or that could be better with this graph? Don't be shy. Call it out if you're shy. If you ran this in Puppet, for example, what would you see? Um, don't be shy. Well, so what actually happens is since Puppet can't run things in parallel, this will actually run each vertex one at a time. And that means that the package manager, let's say yum, is going to yum install PowerTop, and then shut down, and then yum install SL, and then shut down, and yum install Kause. It takes quite a long while. With MGMT, another little engine feature is we can actually look at the graph um, as they're generated and automatically group things together. This is actually the exact same graph as this one. We've just transformed it a little bit. And in this particular case, the packages support this automatic grouping. There were no dependencies to say we couldn't do that. So they'll actually get grouped into a single vertex and run in a single operation. So it actually yum install all of those things in one big shot. Um, let me show you a quick demo of this. The auto grouping? The auto grouping is something that you can actually specify in the code per resource. So by default, it will try and auto group as much as possible for resources that support it. Not every resource supports this, for example. Packages do, files, um, well, packages do, others don't, for example. Um, but you can actually disable it. So if you wanted one particular package to never auto group, you just say auto group false, and it would never do that. But great question. So I'm going to just run this graph. That's basically the one you just saw. It's on Wi-Fi, so let's see if this actually works. Um, so you can see it's not uh, super exciting as a demo, but the auto group actually happened. You can see at the very bottom that it grouped all of those things into the same command. Hey, cow say works, which is great. Um, let's just just to, to answer the gentleman who asked about packages. Watch what happens even if I remove cow say. You should probably not do this on your machine, but I'm going to attempt it. Oops, sorry. Sudo. Just use the. So watch, watch MGMT. I'll just put some enters so you can see here when something happens. I'm just going to remove it. Oops. Uh, oh. What is going on with my machine? Oh. Why is package kit not working? Hmm. It's a little strange. Hmm. I think my package kit is broken. But um, let's just see. You're right. You shouldn't remove the cassette. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what are the <laughs> Fair enough. I don't know. I've done some bad things to my package kit, so perhaps I've corrupted. I was doing some bad things earlier. I might have corrupted my RPM DB, which would be kind of unfortunate. I think I've corrupted my RPM DB, so that's bad. But um, <laughs> what you should do is try doing this. So run this example, do the automatic grouping, and then remove a package. And you'll see that actually the engine will notice and it will start uh, add it right back. Uh, yeah, just a question of a gentleman. So with geographical locations where you um, have things that are running over there, you yep. want to push config to them, but you have other things over here that you want to push config to them, do you have a way of finding that topology? Because you, know, you want to stay with that cluster, so you don't go down, it's irrelevant to that. So um, your question was about geographic replication running the clusters. Um, more specifically, did, was there a particular thing you wanted to solve? Or? Like you want to push config files for a certain site, 
Yeah. Yeah. So, sure. Yeah, I got you. So uh, the, the big problem, if you wanted to have a single cluster of MGMT machines worldwide, um, that probably wouldn't be a smart thing. But that's a fundamental physics limitation, not an MGMT limitation. Um, I, there's hardly, there's very few people or things that actually have world-sized clusters. You'll typically have, say, a, maybe a, a continent-sized cluster or a, a few data, size, data center size clusters that are each separate MGMT clusters. Um, because most things don't need to be replicated in that way. Um, again, just because of time of light and physics and stuff like that. Um, those are just fundamental limitations in RAF protocol and things like that. There is no solution around that. Um, there are other protocols you can use to move stuff around. So you'd probably want to just pick two or three clusters for each data center. Um, having said that, there's some interesting um, special cases of the RAF protocol that we actually use that make things a little bit easier. So you could replicate some stuff, but it's, it's a longer conversation, so we'd have to talk offline. So um, let's just recap, and then I'll finish with some questions. Um, this is, you can't hear the audio, unfortunately, but this is Arthur Benjamin putting the cap back on his pen. It's a recapping joke. I have the same jokes in a lot of my talks, so if you've seen this before, I really do apologize. Um, you all know about the technical blog of James. I recently moved it to a static site. So um, if you want to even patch it, it's on Git. Um, you can all check out GitHub purple idea slash MGMT. You can star it and tell your friends. If we seem really popular, maybe more people will get involved. I have a longer talk with a bunch of different engine features, which takes at least a proper hour. And you can check that out on the YouTubes. I also have another language talk recording, which uh, is missing some of the demos I've shown today. But if you do want to rewatch it before this recording is out, you can check that out. And I've got a good five or six other articles about uh, this tool so far. And I should have a blog post about the actual language that I've presented to you today, uh, hopefully within a week or so. So that's coming soon. Uh, you can find me, Purple ID, on IRC, Twitter, GitHub, uh, Gmail, and so on. Uh, um, just some random nonsense. Um, if you really like this talk, please help me DDoS the organizers. The organizers have been super kind. But I want you to go up and say, thank you for organizing LCA. I really liked Purple Ideas talk. And if everyone does that in this room, they'll have like, a whole bunch of people going up all day. And it'll be hilarious. Yes? <laughs> Not, you know, don't be mean. Just excuse me. Got to ask you something. Yes? Purple Ideas talk was awesome. Let's do that. That'll be fun. Go find James and all those other guys. Um, join our IRC channel. Uh, we don't have Slack because we're not cool like that. But we're on Freenode. So I know you're all good at IRC. Um, we have a Twitter account and a mailing list. So you're welcome to join those, low volume. Um, if we have time, I have one more extra secret demo, but I'm happy to take questions if anyone has any. Thank you very much for listening. Yes, gentleman in the back. Uh, yeah, you said you recently defined the file recap. Yes. So it's a great, I don't know what, what my plan is. So I have, pardon me? Oh, sorry, the question is what I'm going to do next since Red Hat has defunded my project. I'm not sure. Um, I really don't want to start a company that's, if, if I have to, maybe I will. But it's lower on my list because I don't want to do that. I don't want to have to do a proprietary thing. I want to keep this all free software as it is now. Um, if someone wants to fund this work, like and hire me full time or half time, that would be ideal because then I could continue this on and really take it from pretty good to like bomb proof. Um, I don't know. Um, I thought about doing crowdfunding and different things like that. I'm not sure. Um, I don't eat that much food, but I do like food and I, I can only do it so long in my free time. Um, so I'm doing it now just on my weekends and evenings. Um, I wish I had more time to devote to it because I could get things done faster. That's sort of the goal. Uh, but short of that, um, yeah, if you have suggestions or you know people, ping them, ping me. I'm easy to reach and would love to chat about it. So um, how much time we got? Two minutes? One minute. One minute. Another, question. Another question. Go ahead. Yeah. How is that configured? Is that like dynamic? If you've got four of them on four 
<laughs> right. Correct. How do you pick it? Yeah. So actually, at the moment, we've um, there's um, it's fairly hard coded. Um, there's a spot to make a pluggable algorithm, but uh, some of that code is actually very early code and needs to be a little bit rewritten. So um, one of the things we need to actually do is have it so that you can actually plug uh, a custom algorithm in to sort of say label certain machines as never being electable as masters or so on. Uh, that's not allowed at the moment. At the moment, you can just give it one uh, decision, which is uh, you can let it do its thing, or you can say, I would like a, a cluster of ideally five servers. And if it's higher than that, it will remove them. And if it's lower than that, it will try and grow them. So just pick any random five out of the cluster? Correct. Okay. Correct. So there's no, like, you made your masters these six servers? Uh, as I said, at the moment, yeah. that is not a feature which we've implemented. Yeah. Um, that's one of those things. It's a, it would be a great feature to have. Uh, we just haven't done that yet. Um, so if that's the one feature that's stopping you from using it, please uh, ping us. There is one exception, which is actually on, as you start up each daemon, if you want one to never become a server, you can have it pass dash dash no dash server, and it will never be elected. But you can't do that central. You'd have to say it as you run the binary. So it's possible, but not uh, beautifully straightforward. Any other questions? <coughs> yes, gentleman right here. If you've got an existing config environment such as Puppet, yes. That is a fantastic question. Thank you, sir. Uh, the, qu the question was, if you have Puppet already, how do you transition to this? So it turns out there's this, I had this idea when I first started the tool and I first gave the first talk, which was that you could actually take Puppet code, which is, um, has a similar graph data structure, and compile it to run, an R R R and, eh, compile it to run on our engine. And it turns out uh, someone in the audience, like yourself, thought this was a great idea and wrote this. So you can actually cross-compile your code from Puppet to run an MGMT, and now it would run much, much faster and continuously and in real time. Um, not every possible mapping is supported. So if there's something that doesn't actually exist in MGMT that exists in Puppet, it can actually instead create an exec vertex that runs Puppet Apply for that one thing. Um, this hasn't been tested extensively, but most of the code is there, and I think you'd probably get at least 80% of your code just working if you gave it a try. So uh, ping me if you want to know more, and it's Felix who wrote that. So I think that's it. Just to add to that, the, yeah. the reference for the Puppet stuff, because I looked earlier, is on, listed on the GitHub. It is. Some documentation yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Felix is giving a talk about this at Config Management Camp, because he's refreshed it with all the new resources and stuff. So if you're in Ghent, come check it out. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.